Hello booktube, Sarah here and welcome to my channel. Today I'm coming to you with my weekly reviews for September the 8th through the 14th. So I finished six books this week. As usual, all the books will be listed in the description box below with timestamps so you can jump ahead to any of the reviews that you personally want to hear about. So let's jump in and get started. The first book that I finished this week was A Perfect Obsession, excuse me, by Heather Graham. This is a romantic suspense novel, sort of. I will explain that in just a few minutes. Um, this is book number two in the New York Confidential series. This was narrated on audio by Saskia Maraveled, I believe is how you say her name. Um, published originally in 2017, Goodreads average rating of 3.90 stars. I gave this one four stars. And for my challenges, this one was for the Romance Readers Reading Group Challenge for September. Uh, challenge number four, which was Skyscraper Day, which was to read a book that had skyscrapers or tall buildings on the cover or took place in a big city. This one takes place in New York City, so it obviously fit the category. So I am um, trying to be really good and making notes as I finish books so I know exactly what I want to talk about. And so the plot of this story is essentially, um, I don't want to say too much because it is a mystery, thriller, suspense novel. And it is about um, some crazed killer who is killing pretty girls and leaving them um, in tombs. And he's trying to slow the uh, decomp process so they stay looking beautiful. Essentially, that's he's killing them while they're still young and beautiful to keep them looking that way, if that makes sense. So essentially, the entire plot of the novel is our two main characters, which are Craig and Kiernan, um, are trying to capture this, this killer. And Craig is a FBI agent and Kiernan is a psychologist. So this is the second book in the New York Confidential series and typically with these type of romantic suspense novels you can read them out of order and I don't see why you couldn't with this one either. What you are going to miss though is the beginning of Craig and Kiernan's relationship. Unlike a lot of romantic suspense novels this is not a new couple you know for the second book kind of an idea. This is the same couple. This entire series follows the the same two people and I think we're already up to book number four that she has written for these. So you are following the same two people throughout all these books and it's just essentially different cases that they are going on. So again, you're going to miss that whole beginning of the romance, how the two of them met, how the two of them fell, you know, fell into being a couple, fell in love, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, now you're, they're kind of in the relationship. But what I really love about this, of course, is it's a slow burn romance in a way. The two of them aren't even living together. I mean, they're spending a lot of time together and sleeping at each other's apartments and, and so on and so forth. But they're not, you know, that, not like your atypical romance story where at the very end of the book, they're like, hey, let's get married, you know, and then the epilogue is the wedding, like six months later or something like that. You're not getting that. You're getting a more, if I can use the terminology, traditional relationship where they're taking it slow. They both have very demanding jobs. So, you know, and that's why, as I said before, I'm hesitant to label this one as a romantic suspense because to be completely honest, there is no romantic element in it, really. The couple is already established. So you are getting another part, like the next chapter in their relationship where they're discussing moving in together at this point. But, you know, that whole buildup of the will they, won't they kind of part of the relationship is gone. So, you know, I will label it as a romantic suspense because, of course, that romantic element is there, but it's not a true romantic suspense, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this one. Um, another point that I want to make is that there is a ton of history in this, and that is always the case with a Heather Graham book. Um, the reason I wanted to point that out, even though I do talk about it every time I talk about one of her books, is because as I was listening to this on audio, I was also listening to, um, not at the exact same time, but you know what I mean, the Heaving Bosoms podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts. There is only a very small handful of podcasts that I actually listen to because I do listen to a lot of audiobooks, so I don't have a lot of podcast listening time. One of them, of course, is Smart Bitches Trashy Books. Pardon my French. Um, another one, of course, is Heaving Bosoms. And these ones are great. It's Melody and Erin. And every week or every other week or so, they um, read a book and then they do an episode or two and discuss it. And they happen to be discussing an older book by Heather Graham called One War Blue. It came out many, many years ago, and I think it was actually published under Heather Graham's pseudonym, um, Shannon Drake. 
and they were tearing this book apart because it was written in the early 90s it was extremely problematic a part of me still really wants to read it just because I want to kind of read all of Heather Graham's backlist it might not be the best book but you know I'd still like to see her evolution as a writer so this one essentially as I said it's called One More Blue sorry I'm going to discuss this other book just ever so briefly and essentially the biggest problem in this book is it takes place of course during the Civil War and our female lead in this book is a slave owner and you know trying to say that all oh, not not all slave owners are bad and blah 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 and I'm sure a lot of them weren't but it's still very very problematic of course with the ownership of a human being and things like that but anyway what made me want to mention the amount of history in this book that I read a, a perfect obsession is because the girls at the heaving bosoms podcast kept talking about the fact that there was all this history that Heather Graham was pretty much just like listing off Civil War generals left right and center and it was like name dropping but that's what she does and I don't think these ladies had read one of her books before so she really does immerse history into each of her books and that's part of the reason why I love them so much so if you are a history buff you might really appreciate these if you are not someone who is into history you might find it a bit tiresome I will be honest but I personally love it and of course this one is steeped in New York City history um, so yeah, so I did want to mention that. And if you guys have not listened to the Heaving Bosoms podcast, I highly recommend that you do. I will leave a link to their website in the description box below. Go ahead and subscribe. Um, you know, I, I was supporting them on Patreon briefly and then, you know, finances, but I do hope to do that again in the next few months. So yeah, highly, highly recommend. Love their podcast. Anyway, on to the next book that I finished. The next book that I read this week was an an Alaskan Christmas by Jennifer Snow. This is a contemporary romance novel. It is book number one in the Wild River series. This one is being published this year, uh, 2019. It actually comes out on September the 24th. Um, so this was an advanced reader's copy. Um, so special thanks to, of course, NetGalley and Harlequin prov for providing me with an eart copy for me to review this book. Um, the average star rating on Goodreads is 4.42 stars, and I gave this one four and a half stars. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, for my challenges, I actually got to fit this one into a challenge. Again, for my Triple RC challenge, it was number 10, which was Reader's Choice, read any book of your choosing. So, um, I have, <laughs> I just love this one. This, this had all the things that I love about romance novels. It was a small town setting. It took place in Alaska, which is like catnip for me. And it was, took place at Christmas time. I just love stories that take place at Christmas time. And not only was it a romance, but it was also a friendship story as well. So the plot of this novel is about our main character named Erica. And she, um, when she was younger, her mother passed away from, I believe it was complications from a kidney transplant. Her, her mother's body wouldn't accept the new kidney and she ended up passing away. So as Erica grew up, she knew she kind of wanted to be a doctor and she you know did all that now her father is a brilliant surgeon so it runs in the family a bit as well so she went to school and she got her you know doctorate and all those things that one would do to become a surgeon and she works at a big hospital in Anchorage Alaska she works essentially 18 hour days she spends most of her time sleeping at the hospital she has absolutely zero outside life her father is extremely demanding and they work together he is actually like her boss and you know, it's not a father-daughter relationship that one would be used to. This is typical. This is more of a, um, you know, boss to employee type relationship. So, and because he is her superior, of course. So, I mean, she's very, very good at what she does. And at the very beginning of the book, it is just after Thanksgiving, uh, American Thanksgiving, which is like, for those of you who don't know, it's typically like the end of November. Um, and Canadian Thanksgiving is in early October, in case anyone's curious. So, um they kind of the the board of directors at the hospital has issued the fact that she has to take a vacation she has never taken vacation so she's being told she is now off for two weeks um a leave of absence or whatever you want to call it so she kind of hands on haws doesn't know what she wants to do so she decides to go back to the small town that she was born and raised in which is called wild river and while she's there she or before she shows up she contacts her ex-best friend um her and this girl cassie grew up together and they were the best of friends and then after high school they kind of went their separate ways erica moved to the the big city of anchorage and cassie ended up backpacking through europe and she did all these amazing adventures and well erica was putting herself through school so the two haven't really talked in like 10 years and now all of a sudden they're kind of thrown back together again and they don't know how to be friends um, you know, because they haven't really spoken in so long. 
So not only does she meet back up with Cassie when she returns to Wild River, she meets up with Reed, who is Cassie's older brother. And the two of them have a bit of history, uh, Reed and Erica. And of course, feelings kind of get reignited. They never had feelings for each other, so it's not a second chance romance, but it is, um, they were definitely, they weren't even really friends, but they did know of each other and they kind of went through a sort of traumatic experience together when they were young. Um, so that kind of bonded them in a way. And of course, a romance ensues between Erica and Reed. And then of course, the friendship, of course, also between Erica and Cassie was really nice to see grow again um, as adults, how to they could be friends with each other. So at the beginning of this book, Erica was not the most likable character, I will be honest. I, I really didn't care for her at the beginning. She really does grow on you and you really start to like her and understand the reason why she is the kind of person that she is and what it is that drives her. And I thought that was fantastic. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that I loved about this book. Um, the setting, as I mentioned, Alaska is catnip for me. Now I found out, I looked ahead and the second book in the series comes out in April of 2020. So I'm super excited because I'm really hoping it's going to be Cassie's story along with another character we met by the name of Tank. And I think that story is going to be fantastic. But I did find out that I didn't know this. Jennifer Snow is a Canadian author. So even though I love the Alaska setting, a part of me was a little bummed that she didn't set it in Canada because it's right there. <laughs> If you wanted that wintertime mountain setting, may I present to you British Columbia? <laughs> Would have worked perfectly. So yes, I'm a little bummed that they put it in an American setting, but say la vie, as a Canadian, I, I want all the Canadian authors to only write in sort of stories set in Canada. But, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I loved another aspect of this book was the fact that Reed works for a search and rescue. Because, of course, they're in, the, they're in the mountains in Alaska, you know. A lot of people do camping even in the winter time so he works for this search and rescue team in Alaska and those parts of the books were so well done and Cassie being a surgeon came with him on a couple of these these calls that he got and she was able to assist and of course into that also came you know the fact that was she authorized to make some of these drastic decisions I don't want to give away some of those plot points because they're really really good and stuff I didn't see coming, you know, like the one thing that she had to do to the guy, I'm like, wow, you know, like out there on a mountain. Um, really, really good. And, you know, you know, legalities and you don't want to get sued and things like that. But as a doctor, you're under oath to save this person's life. You know what I mean? So really, really good all around story. Absolutely fantastic. This is the first Jennifer Snow I've ever read and it will not be my last. Like I said, I'm super looking forward to the book coming in April. Um, and I have a bunch of her books um, uh, that are on my backlist or on my to be read list that I do plan on definitely getting to in the future. Um, so yeah, so I loved it. Highly recommend it if you're looking for a great Christmas story. The next book that I finished was The Lady and the Highwayman by Sarah M. Eden. This is a historical romance novel. It was narrated on audio by Justine Irie. Um, this was another e-arc that I got from NetGalley, so special thanks again to NetGalley and the publisher Shadow is it? Uh, sorry, Shadow Mountain Publishing for sending me the e-arc for this to review. Much appreciated. Yes, I did listen to it on audio. Um, as I mentioned in my uh, September TBR video, I had a plethora of extra credits from Audible that I wanted to use before I lost them. Um, you know, they disappear if you don't use them in so much time. So I pre-ordered a couple of the e-arcs that I had on, um, that I had from NetGalley, and this was one of them. It was narrated uh, on audio by Justine Irie. Uh, average star rating was 4.27 stars, and I gave this one four stars. And this book did come out on September the 3rd. So go ahead and pick it up. It's already out. I highly recommend it. I really enjoyed this one. This was such a fun, uh, historical romance. I, I just, it was so brilliantly executed. So the plot of this story, it's about this man by the name of Fletcher. And he was, he grew up as like a street urchin. He was, you know, he lived on the streets. He didn't have a family. He was a pickpocket and what have you. And he ended up getting to go to this school for very poor children. And as he grew up, he said, I'm going to make, I'm going to do better. I'm going to be a better person. And he became a writer and he writes for these things called Penny Dreadfuls. And if you don't know what those are, they were very prevalent. This takes place in Victorian London. Um, and they were these like serialized stories that would come out on a weekly or bi-weekly or however, you know, often basis. 
and they would be these stories and as they were called a penny dreadful they would I, I assume cost a penny each um, each issue and you would read through these serialized stories as the weeks go on and he is a writer for them and that's how he makes his money so he makes some money doing this and what he does is he takes that money that he makes and he gives it back to the poor in London and I think that's wonderful he really takes care of the children he wants to get these children off the streets it's not a good place for these kids you know being street sweepers or selling flowers on the corner you know goodness knows what could potentially happen to them so then as the story opens up in comes this person by the name of Mr. King and Mr. King has also started is now writing Penny Dreadfuls and they are doing far better than Fletcher's so Fletcher is losing money because his sales are not as high as Mr. King's so he wants to find out who Mr. King is then we meet Elizabeth who is our female lead in this story and she is also a writer and she writes what are called silver fork novels the same idea as the penny dreadfuls but for a more upper class society and you know but on the sly and you find this out right at the beginning so I'm not giving anything away she is Mr. King um, so she's writing of course under a pseudonym because a woman wouldn't be writing these kind of stories these penny dreadfuls you know deal with monsters and you know bad situations and and things like that you know scary stuff and, and espionage or mystery whereas the more uh, silver fork books or stories that she writes are more probably more of a romance or a what would be term now a literary fiction kind of an idea what I love so much throughout this book was this is how I took it I don't know how if this is how the author meant it to be but was the slight you know cheeky nod to romance novels because throughout the book they kept saying how these penny dreadfuls are only for the lower class and people who don't have a very high education are the ones who read them and you do hear that quite a bit in terms of romance novels they are not for people you know they're 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 brain candy or they're just something to read they're fluffy they're this they're that and when in reality you know anyone can read them so throughout the novel you're hearing these things about penny dreadfuls but then as you're in the upper echelons of society and, 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 and Elizabeth is dealing with some of these aristocratic people on the sly they're like oh but by the way did you read the newest installment of Mr. King's story or whatever so you know that these people are reading these books but they're keeping it on the hush hush because they're not supposed to be reading those kind of things and that's what what I mean what I mean by it being like a cheeky little nod to the romance novel industry in a way um, again I don't know if that was the author's intent but that's how I took it and I kind of loved it for that so of course there is a romance between Fletcher and Elizabeth now interwoven between that entire story is the two stories that Elizabeth and Fletcher have written so Elizabeth's story is called the lady and the highwayman and Fletcher's is about some street urchins or some kids who live on the street dealing with a vampire so every few chapters you're getting another serialized portion of these two stories now those two stories don't have anything at all to do with the main story I did read a few reviews on Goodreads and some people were like oh you know I really didn't care for them so I skipped them I don't recommend that you do that they are delightful absolutely delightful so really you're getting three stories in one in this book and that's what I really loved about it I love the take on it I thought it was a lot of fun and yeah and like they said they really don't have anything to do with it I can see that you could not read the stories and you wouldn't lose anything from the main story but some of the events I found did mirror some things that actually happened in the main plot so yeah again love this four stars I thought it was great the one thing about this one too is that this is a clean romance so for those of you who are looking for something that does not have any adult content this is definitely a book that you would enjoy this is totally a book I could see being read by many many different ages it's absolutely delightful and I highly recommend it the next book that I finished this week was Cowboy Christmas Homecoming by June Favor this is a contemporary romance novel it is book number four in the Dark Horse Cowboys series I have read book number one I have not yet read book two and three um, and now of course as I said this is book number four this is another one that I got as an eARC from NetGalley so special thanks again to NetGalley and the publisher Sourcebooks for sending me this eARC to review for you guys uh, this book is coming out on September 24th so if this sounds like a good book to you definitely go ahead and pre-order it average rating on Goodreads was 4.35 stars I gave this one three and a half stars so I didn't love it but I really did enjoy it um, I did have a few issues with it but I will get into that in just a minute for my challenges this was another one for my triple RC this was for number five which was be late for something day so essentially to read a book that would make you late for something because you're totally immersed in the book and this one absolutely <clears throat> excuse me I found the story very very engaging and highly enjoyable so <clears throat> 
I'll talk about the plot and what I liked about it and then I'll get into a few of my little issues that I did have with the book. So the plot of the story is about our main character named Zach and Zach has just come back from serving overseas in the military in Afghanistan. Now while he was overseas about a year prior to him coming home his father passed away and um, he was unable to get leave or unable to to leave his mission to come back to for his father's funeral. Also in that time just after his father's death um, he lived on a ranch and grew up on a ranch that was run by his dad and his mom and what have you and his mother couldn't handle it all by herself and so she sold it and that was his legacy that's what his father left for him and now he was coming back to nothing he was coming back to some boxes that his mother packed up of his belongings and that's all he has so he's you know kind of very bitter about that at the beginning because all he wanted to do was come home and, and and be a rancher and that's now kind of been taken from him so he comes home to not to his mother's place because she has moved to new mexico but to his uncle's um ranch uh, where his three cousins live, which are the three characters from the first three books. So Zach is also suffering from some very serious PTSD from what is explained at the beginning of the book. Like in one scene, he ends up in the middle of the night. He's standing outside barefoot in like just his boxer shorts and a t-shirt in the snow after kind of having an episode while he was sleeping of, you know, like a nightmare, um, you know, and so it's it's kind of really difficult for him. And then he meets Stephanie and Stephanie, they, they meet like right at the very, very beginning. Like as soon as Zach is kind of picked up from the train station um, by his cousin, he comes back and Stephanie's at the house. And Stephanie's a, a, a firefighter in, I think, Amarillo, because this takes place in Texas. And she is trying to get custody of these two little children that she was there to help when their mother was killed by their stepfather. And they these little kids witness this murder. So there's kind of a whole lot going in the background. Now, like I said, I read the first book, but I haven't read books two and three, but I wasn't really lost because everything was kind of explained to you. Now, for me to go back and read books two and three, I would be spoiled for some of the events that take place, but I will still probably, I will definitely be going back to read them anyway, because, you know, they do sound like they would be really, really interesting. So all the characters were really likable. I really liked Zach. I really felt for him at the beginning. You know, I felt for Stephanie too, dealing with the things that she was dealing with. Um, and that's what I liked. The plot moved well. You know, it, 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 was, it was very well paced. The story was very festive, very Christmassy. There are some really great characters in this. Um, one of the side characters, Leah, who's one of the main characters in one of the other books, her grandmother, she's just a little spitfire and I really liked her. Um, Big Jim, who is the uncle, he is really fantastic as well. But some of the things that kind of I didn't absolutely love were the fact that this book focused a lot on the other characters. Um, I didn't find this as much in the first book, maybe because it was the first book. But now that we're into book four, we were getting a lot of side parts of the other characters. And it's kind of like I really didn't care, you know, on how happy they were and how one is having a baby and yada yada. You know, and I get that they're kind of getting into the Christmas spirit and all those things and it's about family but I felt it took away a bit much from the main story. Um, another thing was the PTSD issue that I already mentioned. I felt it was wrapped up very quickly. He met Stephanie, they went on a couple dates, and all of a sudden he seemed okay. He, at least it wasn't, if he was suffering, it wasn't mentioned as much, if that makes sense. And I just, with it being it, like it was a major plot point on the back of the book, I thought that it would carry more through the rest of the story where it seemed to wrap up relatively quickly and there was no major resolution. It seemed to be he was really suffering from this and it sounded very, very bad. And perhaps maybe he should have gotten some counseling or something, you know what I mean? But it just seemed to be like, yeah, you know, I met a girl and, you know, now we're having adult relations and everything seems to be okay. Again, I could be completely reading into it wrong, but that's what I took from it. Um, Oh my gosh, guys, this is an insta-love story too, just in case you didn't know or wanted to know that. They go on two dates and, you know, try not to spoil anything, but they end up moving in together after two dates. Now, I really can't say too much about that because it does happen in real life. It happened to me. <laughs> my husband and I met in May. We were engaged in July. We married the following July. It, it can happen that quickly, but I just felt, again, out of context because he was suffering from these other issues. And I felt that maybe those were things he needed to work through first before jumping into this relationship with Stephanie, um, especially when she's talking about adopting children and things like that. And the other thing was on the back of the book, it talks about this dog that Zach had while serving in Afghanistan. 
And, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but that part of the book doesn't even happen until 60% of the way through it. So here I was waiting and waiting and waiting for this, this, you know, adorable puppy, you know, not puppy, this adorable dog who, you know, was a military dog to show up. And finally, at 60% of the way through, she does. The last thing that kind of drove me a bit nuts is that all the issues seemed to wrap up really quickly. You know, there was an issue with Stephanie with the, uh, with, um, the adoption of these two children. Um, you know, I don't want to try and give away too many major plot points, but there was also something that she was dealing with with a stalker. And all these things just seemed to wrap up very quickly um, when Big Jim would get involved. Like, all of a sudden, it's like, hey, I'm here, and, and I'm putting my two cents in, so let's just w ma wave a magic wand and make it all better. Well, that's not necessarily the way it works. I would have liked to have seen a bit more struggle for some of the characters. But yeah. But outside of that, this was a really, uh, you know, it, make, it sounds like I might be, you know, um, kicking, you know you know, saying that I didn't like the novel, but I did. Um, I just had some of these issues with it. But if you can, you know, work through that yourself and just read it for what it is and just enjoy it and suspend your disbelief for a few things, it, it's a highly enjoyable Christmas story. It gives you the warm fuzzies. The whole family aspect of it is fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. June Faber is a fairly new to me author. Um, the first book in the series is the first book by her that I read. And I'll definitely be reading more from her. Like I said, I'll be going back to read books two and three highly enjoyable absolutely i do recommend it if you're looking for a great cowboy christmas story the next book that i finished this week was grin and bearded by penny reed this is a contemporary romance novel it is book number two in the winston brothers series um this was narrated on audio by chris brinkley and Silo carmongo i believe is how you pronounce her name published originally in 2016 average rating of 4.19 stars on goodreads guys i gave this one four stars for my Triple RC challenge, this was for National Comic Book Day, which was to read a humorous book, and this book definitely fit the bill. So this is the story of Sierra, uh, Sienna, excuse me, and Jethro. Jethro is the oldest of the Winston Brothers. So the Winston Brothers series, if it's one you're not familiar with, and if you love contemporary romance, you need to read this series. Um, it's about, I think it's five or six brothers and a sister, and they live in kind of the backwoods mountain area of Tennessee, and um, it's their kind of trials and tribulations. That, that's the premise of the, of the series. So this story, uh, we meet Sienna right at the very beginning. And she is actually a very, very famous A-list movie star. She starred in a bunch of movies. She, um, she's very famous. She's won an Academy, was it an Academy Award or a Golden Globe? Something. I don't know. If, maybe it was an Academy Award. She's Hispanic. Um, and she is a plus size girl, which I really like too. And what I really loved about it was the fact that they didn't harp on it every third sentence in the book. It was mentioned in passing. It was mentioned about something. There's one character, um, a co-star of hers in this movie that's being shot during the course of the novel that makes comments that she was turned down for a role. And she feels, she, she thinks it's because, or found out it's because she's Hispanic. And um, so, I mean, there's some prejudice right there. But she didn't want to announce that to everybody, so she kind of made a comment to this co-star, that this male co-star who she did date briefly for like two dates, that it was because she was too short. And his reply back was, well, maybe if you went on a low-carb diet, it would help you. Well, how's that going to help if she's short? <laughs> so it's little throwaway comments like that. But she has this whole little thing where she talks about, she's like, I embrace my size and this and that. And she goes and pretty much says, and that's all we're going to discuss about it. And I love that aspect of it. Um... And Jethro is a park ranger. Like I said, he's the oldest of the Winston brothers, and he is a park ranger. He has a very bad, difficult past. His father ran with a biker gang, and his father tried to bring him into the biker gang, and he did some not-so-great things when he was younger. He meets Sienna when she um, ends up getting lost trying to find this cabin that she's staying at, and the two of them hit it off right from the beginning, and their romance kind of blossoms from there. I loved it. This had some great laugh out loud moments in it. Um, I really, really loved both Jethro and Sierra. Um, Sienna, sorry, I keep pronouncing her name wrong. I do apologize. Um, delightful. And the rest of the siblings are just so much fun. Um, my favorite of all the brothers, and this is, I am reading this series in order, is definitely Cletus. Cletus is my favorite. He just has this very dry, witty sense of humor. And I found out that his book is next and I cannot wait to read it. So I'll be trying to get to that hopefully before the end of the year. Um, but yeah, this one sounded really, really good. I just want to see if I made any more actual, um, any more, uh, oh yes. Um, this one had just the right amount of adult content. This wasn't overtly adult and it wasn't necessarily behind closed doors, but it wasn't 
constant and it wasn't long drawn out scenes. You know, if adult content is something that makes you just a little bit uncomfortable, it's not something that you enjoy reading about, I recommend that you still give this series a try because it's, it's like I said, it's just the right amount. It was just enough without being overtly adult, if that makes sense. Um, and the only qualm, the only issue that I had with this book is that without getting too much into it, because I don't want to give away again too many plot points, but Jethro has a friend named Claire and Claire's husband passed away years earlier. And he and Ben, that was Claire's husband, were best friends. And he vowed to his buddy, you know, I'm going to look after your wife and blah, blah, blah. So of course she's a widow. So he's there every Sunday having dinner with her. The whole town seems to think there's something going on. And then something is revealed at the, towards the end of the book that kind of never gets resolved. Um, again, I don't want to say what it is because I don't want to ruin any plot points for anybody. I do think that she's going to make an appearance in an upcoming book because she kind of has a thing with one of the other brothers. So maybe it'll get resolved then. But um, not everything gets tied up in a, in a bow at the end of the story. Let's put it that way. And you know what? Now that I think about it, that's not necessarily a bad thing because you want something that's going to keep you reading to the next story, right? So yeah, really, really enjoyed this one. This is such a fun series. Um, I'm really enjoying Penny Reed's writing. Um, she's really funny, really fun. The characters are absolutely relatable. I mean, even though Sienna is a big famous movie star, she is totally relatable. And I really, really love this one. Um, and the last book that I finished this week, I'm not going to have a lot to say about this one, you guys. Didn't particularly love it. Is um, Rebel's Bargain by Annie, Res oh, Annie West. Excuse me. This is another contemporary romance novel. It is book number seven in the Chatsfield series one. So the Chatsfield series, I found out, is about these kids who are heirs to a hotel empire. Think the Hiltons. You know what I mean? Like Paris Hilton and stuff like that. Um, and this is the seventh book in the first series, which is the series that is like the London-based hotel. So they do have a series two, which I think takes place in New York. Um, but that's all that was ever written. And I don't know if there's any more, any more plans, because supposedly these hotels are all over the world. And I'm like, I kind of like to read more because I really love the idea, the premise of it. But unfortunately, as you guys probably will know from watching my, my channel, the Presents novels are not, not necessarily my favorite books. Anyway, Harlequin Presents novel 3281. Um, this was originally published in 2014. Um, average rating of 3.65 stars on Goodreads. I gave it three stars. So I did enjoy it, but I didn't love it. Um, for my challenges, this is, of course, um, my 2014 book for my 40 Years of Harlequin project. And as I said, I'm trying to make notes now on what my kind of thoughts are when I finish a book. And I just literally wrote one line for this book, and that's um, that he is kind of a jerk and she's a bit of a pushover. <laughs> that's all I really have to say. Um, the plot of this story is very typical for these types of novels. These are very alpha male centric type stories. And I think that's what rubs me the wrong way is because I'm not a fan of those. I'm not a fan of a man, you know, needing to take care of his woman or a woman being the more damsel in distress type of an idea. I'm not saying that that's what this one was, but that's how these these this line tends to come off to me anyway. So um, the premise is, is that our main character, whose name I cannot pronounce, Orsino, I think is how you say his name, and her name is Poppy. And um, he gets very, very, in, very badly injured in a climbing accident. He was mountain climbing. And Poppy is his ex-wife. They have been separated for about five years, but not officially divorced. Something happened to their relationship that she was to blame in a way. And he walked out, even though he read into the situation wrong. It's a whole lot of angst, you guys. Um, and he left her and she kind of tried, kept trying to get in touch with him for like six months. And he wasn't answering her calls or anything like that. And then she kind of gave up. Um, and she is a very successful model and he is of course the son of this hotel empire so he can pretty much do whatever the heck he wants and live off the family trust um, and then he gets hurt and he calls her and because he wants to see her and something about making her pay um, for what he did or what she did to him so he's going to make her be his nurse for the next however many weeks that he is in recouping and he's very badly injured he broke a few ribs broke his wrist he's snow blind so he is barely has any sight but yet all he can seem to think about is sleeping with her again and you know but yet he wants to get revenge on her for something so again that very alpha male that very that type of story it was well written and i did like poppy i didn't care for him so much but i did like poppy quite a bit um she had a backbone to her which i did like which i'm finding more and more 
these these books that are more recently written you are getting the female leads having a much more of a backbone than you ever did before um and i just think that seems to be the case with a lot of romance novels you know um a, a more feminist spin on these if you will um the adult content in this one is there but again it's it's minimal it's not you know long drawn out scenes or anything like that it's a short book you guys it's under 200 pages the one thing i do want to give props to is i kind of love this cover um i love this cover design uh if you are familiar with the presents novels you know that they are mostly a white cover with this banner and then there's a circle and then within the circle has that the the cover image um i kind of really like this aesthetic I like the way it looks. Um, I just think it looks classier. I don't know what it is. Perhaps even, I don't know. I, I really, really like it. But the entire Chatsfield series is in these kind of covers. I do want to read more of these. I'm not saying don't read this one. What I'm saying is, is that if you like an alpha male story, check it out. But these are the kind of books that you kind of have to read and roll your eyes at at the same time when he starts off on some sort of a tangent. You're like, yeah, 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 whatever, buddy. Kind of an idea, right? But yeah, but other than that, I mean, it was enjoyable and I will definitely be reading more. Um, so yeah, anyway, guys, that is all that I have for this week. I do hope that you enjoyed it. Please let me know in the comments below if you've read any of these books and what you thought about them um, or what was your favorite book that you read this week because I'd love to know that too. And until my next video, everybody, take care and happy reading. Thank you all so much for watching. Bye, guys.